Warning, the opinions shared on this show are those of free-thinking individuals who without payment or coercion chose to be here and share those opinions with the world. This podcast may contain language, opinions, and ideas some people may find offensive and or controversial. Listener discretion is advised. the ninja here with wally danger Wahlberg. here is your host b dizzle thank you very much ninja and welcome back we've missed you here thank you thank you everyone who is joining us tonight we had a nice break away from the show last week but we are back and we are back to bring you interesting stories conspiracies cryptids aliens ufos what have you now tonight i wanted to have kind of a Laid back, kind of fun show. Not really at delve into anything too serious. You know, we had last week off, we're coming back. So we picked out a variety of topics to talk about tonight. So, Danger, what do we got? Yeah, tonight on the show, we put together a few different topics and some stories to go along with them. Our first topic is going to include recent technological advancements. After that, we're going to be talking about some food and beverage type things. Then we're going to be discussing some stories involving interesting humans and things like that at the very end we're going to close things out with some stories about geological perhaps or astro geological phenomenons happening here on earth no yeah. danger did you just make that word up astro geological might not be a, a word you'd find but in you Webster. know what i like it so i think yeah it looks like <laughs> it looks like astro geology is a thing it is Yep, and astrogeological would therefore also be a thing. All right. All right, so we're not Cheers that original. That. Cheers to that. All right, so before we get into that, though, I would like to just go around and say hi to everyone. Woo woo. First off, Danger. Danger, how you been, bud? How was your week? You know, if I'm not busy killing wildlife in my Give vehicle. Give some context to that. We don't want people to freak out and think that you're a, a maniac here. Here's the thing. My car that I currently have... If I fix the damage from striking the most current animal that I have hit with this vehicle, not intentionally, okay, mind you, I will be on my fifth bumper. It will be the fifth bumper that this vehicle has, which is about four too many, if you ask me. I agree. Well, I'm sorry to hear that of your misfortune. But, you know, I'm sure the animals that you have destroyed... <laughs> <laughs> are uh, a lot more sorry about the whole thing. Yeah, I don't feel good about that <laughs> aspect of it either. Well, but... no, I, and I understand your frustration because it, you know, it is a lot of money you've spent to repair your vehicle. But, say la vie. The ship sails on. It certainly does. Moving right along. Ninja, ninja, ninja. How have you been, my friend? We have missed you. Dude, and... it, it, is, it has been uh, a crazy last couple of weeks. I uh, I went on an unexpected well, adventure, not, just, not too unlike The Hobbit. D well, before we get into that, just to refresh everybody's memory, Ninja is an integral part of the show. He is our uh, official announcer. Danger filled in for him while he was gone. We were very concerned of, about him. He was on our first inaugural podcast and he was absent for the next two and then we had our break and now he's back ninja <laughs> take it away <laughs> all right so uh just a little context of the story i install outdoor irrigation systems so i i dig in the ground and we run sprinklers some... for the layperson yeah sprinkler systems underground sprinkler systems so we we use some machines we dig in the ground that's what we do 
Um, so I'm on an install. They're running the trench machine. I'm sitting there uncoiling the pipe as the machine is going, and and a sinkhole actually opened up at my feet, and uh, it happened beneath you. Yeah, literally beneath my feet, and I'm and I'm using literal in the correct sense. That is not figurative. Directly beneath my feet, it began to open. It happened so quickly, I didn't have time to react. No, there was no indication that this was going to happen to you. You know, it it's never happened before. As we were, uh... I mean. Uh, Minnesota here, where we are at, we're not known for our sinkholes, are we? Well, we, we do get a couple because we do have uh, some good groundwater, so it does occasionally happen. Uh, it, it, it's just a, it would be a freak occurrence to have a sinkhole just open up at your feet. It's not, like, so common that it is known to happen. That's where, that's where the story starts to take uh, an interesting twist. The sinkhole opens up, and I fall into uh, what is clearly an underground crevice or cave of some formation. I'm, I'm not a geologist. I couldn't tell by the brief glimpse that I got. So I, I, I fall, and, and I just remember blurs before I hit the ground, and I lose consciousness. I, I, I must have hit the ground hard if anyone's ever banged their head. I mean, you, you might be conscious. Of, you, you just don't know. But my next like real clear memory is, uh, is waking up in a, uh, a, a dim... A cave-like structure of some unknown make. Just to drop the truth bomb on you, I had been kidnapped by the mole people, and they had uh, freakish whisker noses. Whisker noses. Yeah, you've seen, you've seen like. I've seen a mole. Yeah. Yeah. So they, so they got these like upturned pig noses with crazy like fleshy whisker things growing out of the side of them. They were uh, short, stoutly built, and they needed my help. All right, so you see these mole people. They've kidnapped you because they need your help. Did they speak a language? Was there, is there, like, obviously you had some form of communication. No, the the, the mole people were quite aware of the English language and, in fact, several of our uh, human languages uh, as living underground. They have access to uh, most of our waste and our deposits. Uh, So over the course of human history, our culture has slowly been seeping down to them. So uh, they are aware of us. That is that is how they end up uh, seeking me out for help. Not not me specifically. I happen to just be the person they found. For you see, the mole people were in danger, and they, they were in danger from what? Yeah. Well, you have me intrigued here. Look. The mole people's natural enemy are in fact the Carcalax. Carcalax. Yes, the Carcalax. The Carcalax is a great subterranean lizard beast. Oh, so it's one thing. Yes. Uh, and the mole people had worshipped the Carcalax. For, for generations, as uh, as a terrible tyrant god, who uh, I, I, I'm not exactly sure the full historical details, but uh, killed whenever he wanted and was basically catered to like like a bully. Um, no, I'm uh, no. Just forgive me for a second. I don't want to uh, to take this this uh, in a different direction. You met mole people in the earth. Does this give any credence to the hollow earth theory? Did you? Is that what we're dealing with here? Is there a hollow? No, earth? Uh, definitely. There there is a a vast subterranean world buried deep within our own world no uh, I, I i saw like i said very very little of it it okay. was uh i i didn't go on on a, a vast quest and and march through the the darkness of our of our subterranean world i i was there very briefly now did these mole people could just from your limited interaction with them did it seem like they were moles that had evolved to be a humanoid type of thing a creature or were they just a creature that subsequently, because of the way they lived, they evolved to have mole-type features? Not a biologist, not an evolutionary biologist. I'm, I'm well, afraid I, you know, I, had, I, 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 w- I would love to speculate, because they definitely were humanoid. They had two feet, two hands. It, it, it could be speculated that they had e- basically evolved from an ancient mole relative, uh, as, as uh, most mammal life on this earth does have uh, two forelegs and two rear legs, and our first four legs evolved to hands as we began walking upright. But before I, I lose track of where I'm going here, with the Carcalax, he demands sacrifices of the mole people, and they, they must uh, fight for his amusement. In a coliseum? type of uh, scenario is that what it's, it's it's more of a, a a dank like quarry pit it was uh did you see it well yeah i had to fight in it oh spoiler alert so the the carcalax was demanding uh, of the mole people for his thousandth year of rule that he should have the most grand sacrifice of all and if he was not pleased with the sacrifice so the carcalax himself could speak uh yes but i i could not understand him personally right. as it was more like a hisses and clicks kind of thing right. the the mole people then translated for me uh, but if if you could if you could understand how animals 
can display emotion, I could clearly see that the Karkalax was understanding of uh, the mole people's speech and my own speech. So it was an intelligent beast, but its mouth did not facilitate English language. Makes okay. sense. Now, I have a quick question. Now, if you could equate this mole people civilization to a civilization that has existed on Earth in the sense of uh, technology-wise... Where would you put these mole people? How, like, what kind of technology did they possess? Did they have fire? Uh, oh, did... no, they, 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 they definitely had fire. Okay. Um, did they have, like, um, stone spearheads? Stuff like, were they, yeah, were they, they dealing with metal, stone? Yes, yes, they, they did, they did have, uh, proper metallurgy. They had, uh, ores and refined, uh, ores into, in, like, actual metal. So they had, you know, steel and, well, I guess I don't really know if it was steel per se, but... They they did they did have refined ore metals, so they did have like some sort of metalworking technology. I guess uh, without again, I'm not a historian. I would put them around some sort of medieval level technology with access to a little bit more because they had uh, again access to our culture. So they had uh, knowledge of things like clockworks, uh, moving parts, locks, and things like that. Uh, so if, if anything, our society actually uh, kind of pushed theirs ahead. Interesting. So, the mole people had taken me before the Karkalax, and he was not happy. Were he, you supposed to be the sacrifice? Yes, I, I was going to be. Oh so the Karkalax does not necessarily demand a mole person sacrifice, just uh, a sacrifice. Is that what we're saying here? I, I guess I don't know what he did before I arrived. Okay. So, the, the Karkalax... Uh, was not only displeased with me, he was uh, displeased with the mole people for, for bringing him. I don't know if uh, humans are ugly, if we just don't smell good to him. And as he was going to take his uh, revenge on the mole people for displeasing him, uh, a small splinter group of mole resistance came to my aid and rescue. We battled the Karkalax in the pit. They threw me a spear, and uh, we did an epic duel. Uh, unfortunately, I was severely wounded, and, uh... Severely wounded? Now, you can say severely wounded, but, um, fill us in a little bit. What happened to you? Well, it, it's, uh, a bit embarrassing. Uh, the Karkalax, uh, whipped with his tail and caught me right in the left nut. And, and I gotta say, I, I went down. It was, it was not pleasant. So, with, with my bruised ball, I, uh, I dropped my spear... Uh, the Karkalax, uh, unfortunately rendered a few of the resistance fighters, uh, into piles of bone and flesh. Once I recovered, I was able to take my spear and, uh, come up behind the Karkalax who was feasting on some of my, uh, fallen rescuers and stab him in the neck. Quite fiercely, I might add. And at this point, the Karkalax began to bleed quite profusely. Uh, it, it was, it was pretty horrid. He died terribly. It was, uh... For for an ancient lizard god, it was it was pretty pathetic. So essentially, you're telling us that you were installing sprinklers. A vast hole opened up beneath you, where you were subsequently kidnapped by mole people, who needed you to become their champion and rescue them from this lizard oh. god that oh. lives within the earth. Oppressive, an oppressive lizard god. An oppressive lizard god. Uh, is, that yeah. where, is that what you're telling us? Yes, and and for my uh, success in this uh, endeavor. They made me their king. So you, sir, are the king of the mole people. Not, not quite. I, I, I did enjoy uh, the, the offer, and uh, I did enjoy some of the mole people's generosity for a few days. Unfor you mean like the mole people women? The mole women. Is that what you're talking about? Uh... I, I will get into that. Uh, well, never mind. No, I, Let's I just try to keep this show, like, yeah. family friendly. This okay, is... so... So I, I, I did enjoy the mole people's hospitality for a few days, but unfortunately their architecture is a bit short for I like spend a lot of days walking around like my neck bent over. It's really bad for your back. Everything is hard. They don't really have a good sense of taste. Their food is very bland. Um So did they bring you did, did they bring you back to the surface here? Yes, yes. Well, it bring me back or, or showed me the way up. There's uh quite a quite a like I said, a vast cave system down there. So they brought me to a cave that led me back to the service. I wished them all fond farewell and uh, and then departed. Well, to Pretty be honest with you, Ninja, I was very surprised to hear from you. We were worried about you when you uh, didn't uh, make an appearance on the second podcast. We thought something might have been awry. Uh, we commented on it, and we'd hoped that you were out researching some great mystery. Um, when you didn't make it to the third show, we just assumed you were laying dead in a ditch, and we decided we'd move on with life. So I was very surprised when I heard that you had this amazing adventure, and I want to thank you for sharing it with us. And, you know, we are very happy to have you back. I am very happy to be back, and as former king of the mole people, I would uh, like to uh, extend my uh, my warmest thanks 
to my subjects. Uh, I hope you guys can hear this. Oh, wait, that's right. You don't have the internet. That's why I left. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ninja, for that wonderful story. All right, so let's get into it here. Danger, what's our first topic? We're going to be looking at a new technological breakthrough that may be able to help computers run 1,000 times faster. All right, and we're on ScienceDaily.com here, and the headline reads, Computers 1,000 times faster. Quick change materials break silicon speed limit for computers. Right. So the quick change material, also known as phase change materials, are capable of switching back and forth between two different electrical states, the first being crystalline and conducting, while the other is glassy and insulated. This change happens in billionths of a second, and is going to allow the computers to be created, that is, the architecture of their hardware, in a way that is far more condensed. Because it's more condensed, the information will travel from spot to spot more quickly. Current silicon methods have issues with being too condensed in terms of the hardware architecture, where the electrons can bounce from one place to another place. Now, silicon-based processors, they're limited by how small they can get. According to this article, they are 20 nanometers is their limit as far as uh, size. Now, 20 nanometers, that, that is incredibly small. Yeah, just to put that into perspective, according to nano.gov, a human hair is approximately 80,000 to 100,000 nanometers wide. Okay, so to give you some idea, 80,000 to 100,000 nanometers wide is a human hair. The silicon-based hardware can get down to 20 nanometers. Now, if you think about that for a second, human hair, 80,000 to 100,000 nanometers. The silicon-based uh, computer hardware is 20 nanometers. That is incredibly small. You can, it, it, it boggles your mind to think how small that is. The technological advancement here is how much closer they're able to put these by switching to the PCMs, or the phase-changing materials. So when they make these devices out of the PCMs, how small are we talking they can get these things? So instead of being 20 nanometers in size, they go down to 2 nanometers. So like one-tenth the size. Yes, and basically the way that the speed of the computer is to exponentially increase based on the compacting of the size of the hardware architecture is what makes it one-tenth of the size equals a thousand times faster computing speed. Well, gee, I mean, I can't even really, like, comprehend all the different things. Because right now I know one of the things that's holding technology back or holding computer processing back is it's not about how much speed or power we need it, but how many uh, multiple computations it can run at once. So with this, you're going to have... Uh, a processor that could that could basically be running hyper complex programs doing multiple complex uh, I don't know I guess what you'd want to call it multiple commands multiple operations at, at the same time run off of a single processor well i think basically what this is saying is you could have 10 processors or 10 components where you would normally have one and that that is such a leap forward that we can't even begin to understand that the effect that this is going to have on our society and our world. Yeah, I mean, like one of the one of the first things my mind goes to is uh, what what is this going to do for science? Because uh, a lot of our astrophysicists and stuff like that they they get hurdled by uh, the the amount of time it actually takes to like break down and and uh, work these equations out and try to balance the equations on their on a lot of their theories. So I wonder how this hyper-fast computing will, will uh, affect the speed of our scientific advancement. All right. We will have a link for this article in the description below. Yeah. All right. Next up, we have from the HuffingtonPost.com. What does an atom sound like? Well, apparently it's a D note. Now, any musicians out there will know what a D note uh, probably sounds like, you know. But scientists apparently constructed an artificial atom 0 0.01 millimeters long and placed it at the end of a superconducting material. They then guided sound waves along the surface of the material, bounced sound off the atom, and then recorded what came back using tiny microphones located on the other end of the material. Now, why this is important? Because it is ever increasingly becoming evident to scientists that sound is much more important or much more crucial in the foundation of not only creating things but how things are arranged now the the reason why i guess that might sound a little odd for people but we can throw a little context on that is what we think of as sound 
is actually vibrations traveling through space. So that it's actually an energy wave. Well, every, well, yeah, exactly. Everything is really energy. And sound. when people think of sound, they automatically just equate it with something you can hear. And that is what we think of sound as. But sound really is just energy and waves traveling through space. Like yeah. you said, what we know as sound is waves what, of energy traveling through the air. Yeah, and the, the waves that our ears pick up and then transmit to our brain. So it, our, our, what we hear as sound is really just our brain's interpretation of our sensory organs getting those energy waves. And to throw in the mix with that, your eyes are pretty much just black holes that are taking in energy waves of light in your surroundings as well. Yes. Um, light and sound, the difference there being light is a wave and a particle, whereas in sound is a wave. I don't think uh, sound has been shown to be a particle. Oh, sorry. But anyway, back to why this is uh, important to the, the scientific community here. It's important in the sense that it gives us a greater understanding of the fundamental building blocks of what we know as the universe. It, it expands our knowledge and allows us to make better decisions based on the knowledge we have. So the reason I was drawn to this article was just because it is a a step stone, if you will, in the expansion of human knowledge. And I think that is a good thing. It is always a good thing to be expanding our knowledge. And, and the great thing about it is, is the way human knowledge works. This might not seem significant now, but in the future, this breakthrough might allow for even more tremendous breakthroughs in the future. So we never know what, what exactly the consequences well, this discovery will have in the future. Well, exactly. But you have to truly grasp how important sound or waves of energy are and how they uh, manipulate matter. Now, if anyone out there is familiar with the science of cymatics, that is the science of sound and its effects on matter. You can take a tray of sand, place it above a speaker, and pass a certain frequency sound through that sand. It will form a very specific pattern based on the frequency. I believe I've seen videos now, of this. Now, if you change that frequency, it will form a new pattern. If you make the frequency higher, the pattern will be more complicated. Now, the interesting thing with cymatics is, let's just say for the sake of argument here, or not the sake of argument, sake of discussion here, that if I turn it to 132 hertz, the, the sound passing through the sand. Is that a relevant number for any particular no, reason? No, it was a number I grabbed out of the air. So I pass 132 hertz through the sand. It makes a complicated pattern, and I turn it down to 110 hertz it would make a less complicated pattern. Now I turn it back up to 132 hertz again, it will make the exact same pattern it made before. It's not a variable thing. That's what makes this interesting. Yeah, I, I actually see that being very interesting. I can, from that, almost imagine a future where human beings using advanced technology can use sound waves to reshape matter. Absolutely, that's an awesome implication of what it might mean just to like be able to send a specific sound wave and it resonates with an item in such a way that it transforms. That is some exciting technology to think about. This, in the here and now, may have implications for quantum computing because of the fact that the sound from the atom, these scientists are postulating that it's divided into quantum particles. So we may be able to advance our quantum computing technology through this advancement and through this study. You know, there's much speculation throughout history of what sound has been used to do in manipulating matter. A lot of people think that sound was used to build the pyramids uh, obviously it's just speculation but you can look around the world today and there's still examples of this happening now it's all hearsay to me i've never seen it personally you can find people who have been in tibet the monks there and people have claimed to see monks chant around a huge boulder and gotten it to not only levitate but move just by chanting at it so you know we don't know the true implications of what sound can do and I think this is just, this is something that is better allowing us to understand the true power behind sound. Moving along here. Up next, we're going to be discussing micro needles. And what these are, we will have in a video in the description below linked for this topic. And I found this interesting because this could revolutionize the way medicines are given to people. 
the way vitamins are given to people, the way we test for diseases or drugs. This could revolutionize medicine. Now, what this is, it's made out of a polymer similar to soft contact lenses, and you will get all this information if you watch the video, but, you know, we're here to discuss these things. And according to the gentleman who has developed this, it feels similar to a cat licking you or a piece of Velcro touching your skin. There's no pain and there is no uh, bleeding from this. These little needles, micro needles on this sheet, are only about half a millimeter, at the most, half a millimeter in length. This is another thing that they're measuring in nanometers, right? Yes. So I just, I found it very interesting that we are getting away from invasive medicine and we're we're trying to move towards less invasive techniques and this you know to go along with the less invasive techniques we have you know robots that can uh, do surgery on people and go in through a small a smaller incision and with cameras and small micro tools they can perform surgeries that 20 years ago you would have had three surgeons in there and a person flayed open for the world to see where now they can just enter in a small incision with two little robotic arms and complete the whole thing. But it's along the same lines of how I just, I think it's wonderful how medicine is moving towards a more invasive, or less invasive modality. Yeah, he, he talks about it briefly in the video, but he talks about uh, how it can do away with needles uh, as is the primary form of uh, delivering vaccines or other uh, needed uh, injections, uh, which is good because then uh, the, the needle never risks cross-contaminating, so you'll never have uh, a bloodborne illness transfer from a needle again through accident uh, or otherwise. And then uh, you also don't have to puncture human skin, which uh, not only can lead to uh, the infections and, uh, and other access points like that, but if you've ever had a, a blown vein from an IV at a hospital or cellulitis from uh, an infected uh, injection point, it's uh, it, it actually is a, a real thing and it uh, is rather uncomfortable. So. Yeah, I do think those are good points that you made, especially about the risks that you avoid through regular injections but i do want to clarify that micro needles do puncture the skin they just only puncture through the very first layer of it so yeah. they don't cause bleeding but they do have to puncture the skin yeah, that, that's a good point to make i guess by puncturing the skin i didn't mean like the the entirety of your layer of skin so these micro needles they're laid down on the skin they're, they're built on, on a small platform, a small sheet. They're laid down on your skin. They puncture the first layer of skin, like Danger said, and then the material absorbs moisture from your skin and allows the transfer of drugs and medications. Now, when they remove these needles from the skin, they could see that they were not leaving any polymers behind in the skin or anything like that. So, so no residue. Yeah, no residue left behind, which is good because you don't want that stuff left in your body. Yeah. Oh. So I just, uh, this was exciting to me because I know I don't like having uh, shots done. I mean, it's not like when I was a child, I don't... Uh, I don't dread a shot, but it's still not a I will, pleasurable experience. I will admit, I still dread a shot. I mean, I could take it, but man, I still do not like it. I still <laughs> get that childlike nervousness rearing up in the back of my mind. But I, I, I think this would, uh, this will do a lot of good for a lot of people. Not only to help regulate medications, like they say in the video, elderly patients who may sometimes forget to take medications. This way, it could be somehow time released where they could put their, you know, their assistance. Uh, the yeah, caregiver could put it on Monday, and they wouldn't even have to think about it. For the yeah, I, I like, I like, I like the way he described it. Kind of in the in the video, it led me to believe that uh, the doctor's office could just send you, like, if you take a several chronic medications, they could just customize one of these sheets for you and just send you the Monday sheet that might have drug A, B, and C, and then your Tuesday sheet might only have A and C, and then Wednesday goes back to A, B, and C. So then you just basically have a calendar of your meds. You just take off the appropriate date. Slap it on your arm and you've got all the appropriate drugs. It's like an advent calendar for surviving. <laughs> <laughs> for for all those who are listening who do not know what an advent calendar is, danger. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> an, an advent calendar is something that mostly children, I'm sure here in America, but I'm sure throughout the world, uh, different countries have these as well. But it's a countdown calendar every day. You pull open a different page of this or a different little pocket of this calendar thing. And there's a little piece of candy in there. And it has a little story going along with Christmas. It's all a Christmas thing. Anyway, moving along. On yahoonews.com, 
What do we got next, Danger? We've all heard of what it means to bite the hand that feeds, but have you ever heard of the hand being bitten by food? Well, that's just what happened in our next story. Severed snakehead kills chef cooking cobra soup. I know, I assume in 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 uh this uh cobra soup, I, I guess the, the was the cobra alive when he did he like decapitate it right then and there? Well, a chef cooking soup from cobra flesh died in China after he was bitten by the snake's head, 20 minutes after it was cut off. Now, I think a lot of us have heard that a snake's head can still strike even after it is decapitated, yeah. just from different uh, muscle reaction and uh, muscle spasms. Uh, Ninja, you were telling me a story earlier about um, something from your childhood. Yeah, well, actually, a uh, former Boy Scout here, uh, we learned that one uh, on the old camping trips. And then, uh, you know, later in my youth, a friend of mine had uh, run over a rat snake wanted to take its skin as long as it was dead that flashed back and uh got a big old rock crushed the rattlesnake's head left it on top of him and this uh, so he could decapitate it to, to not do this as, as uh our scout master had taught us it uh it doesn't matter if the flesh is still warm the muscles can still spasm pen fang was preparing a rare asian delicacy from the indonesian spitting cobra when the snake's severed head bit him when he was throwing it in the bin he died before anti-venom could be administered now, this is just an assumption. Um, this is not the first time he has prepared a snake soup. You would think that he would be of a of more of a conscientious mind to know these things. You no, think I'll so just I'll just throw one at you there with that. That's a almost like a common human fallacy. He might have become blinded by overconfidence as he'd done it enough times that he uh, he felt he didn't need to show as much care as he had been taught. I know that in my work, I I have a couple jobs i often do that as well and it has uh not I, always paid off for me. I, I honestly i think that's just a common human mistake and unfortunately in this man's case it happened to be fatal yeah we all know you're supposed to crush the head and bury it immediately <laughs> well that's just common knowledge yeah i mean boy Maybe, scout or not not that well i think fundamentally if you're going to be eating something that can kill you you just run that risk. Whether it be a spitting cobra or a uh, puffer fish in Japan, they like to eat those. But I know that a chicken strip is not going to bite me and potentially kill me. Now, I, I actually have worked in my younger years uh, at a butcher shop, and I have participated in in running animals down the kill chute. Uh, I, 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 that I, sounds horrible, by the way, the it, kill it, chute. It, it, no, that's that's actually the the term that the man I worked for used for it. It was uh, it was quite quite awful, actually. In the process of killing any any animal that it, that possesses the strength to kill you like when we were running cows down the chute you have to be careful because if that cow decides to to do something unexpected and you were not prepared for it they could kick you in the chest and break all your ribs and or a, a kick to the temple of your head could crush your skull oh you e easily be a, suffer a fatal blow i think uh while we here at red herring radio take no joy in this man's death i think everyone has to admit that when you're dealing with something like this that's the risk you take so. Yeah, any anything anything life threatening needs to be taken with some seriousness, even if the the risk is is minor. It's still a risk. So next up here on WesternDailyPress.co.uk, we have an interesting story of a team of boffins. What is a boffin? I've never heard that term. Boffins brew the perfect invention, the chocolate teapot. Chocolate teapot. Now, I found this very interesting because you would assume chocolate would melt. Yeah, I had to, I had to like, search in the story to find the details about this when it intrigued and the hell out of me how a, they did that. Well, the the title of this story is a bit misleading because, yes, they did create a chocolate teapot. And, yes, they did brew tea with it. But it's not as if they stuck this chocolate teapot over a burner and just boiled now, the tea now this is this is important to note the, these are english men that are doing this and uh the english take their tea pretty seriously uh us westerners here in america have a very different way of preparing our tea in europe or in in england uh they they boil the water separately add it to a teapot and then stew the leaves and then let it sit and then pour that from the teapot so they most of their teapots never go onto the stove because they have like porcelain teapots and stuff you can't put that on a burner so this, this teapot was created by master chocolatier John Castello and his team from the Nestle's Product Technology Center. Now, basically what they did was they took a silicon mold and they made layers of dark chocolate and it took about two and a half hours to create this teapot and they found that they could heat up and brew the tea in such a way that the chocolate inside the pot would melt but it wouldn't move, meaning that it would facilitate the brewing process. And they found that the tea was brewed correctly, 
had a small hint of a chocolate flavor, but it wasn't it wasn't like a chocolate drink. I'm, I'm interested in the exact details behind it. Unfortunately, they're a little vague about it in the in the article. I'm sure there's a couple links there they can they can find some more info. But the the secret of this seems to be brewing the chocolate, the melted chocolate inside, not moving because that melted chocolate in between the heated liquid. And the unmelted chocolate seems to have acted as an insulator. And even though it was melted, it, it prevented it from heating up the rest of the chocolate so quickly that it could not be uh, brewed. The beverage could not be brewed. Yeah. Now, again, I just want to stress that this, this story really has no significant importance in anyone's life. You know, the stock market is not going to rise and fall by the chocolate teapot. Now, now, I but here at Red Herring Radio, we took a look at everything, and I found this uh, I found this story very interesting. Now, what, what I like about this, and this is one of the things that I like, about Red Herring Radio, and this is why I've chosen to participate in the broadcast, is uh, human curiosity and, and human just like, hey, let's do something for the hell of it. It, it is it is a great quality in humanity responsible for uh, a great many things in, let's in our Let's try to society. do something that seems like it can't be done, right? Yeah, the, the, the thing is like, hey, let's do it because we can, because we have the ability to try. It's, it's, a, it's one of our great qualities in our species. Up next on Business Insider. Com. Public fridges giving out beer in Europe only work for those with Canadian passports. The Canadian beer company Molson has placed public fridges stocked with beer throughout Europe. Now, the only way these fridges can open is if a Canadian citizen with a passport scans it. Again, the story has no real legitimate importance in anyone's life, unless you're Canadian, but I just found it intriguing because it is a very good marketing tactic here no, no, that what, they have just, going on. Just curious, um, I, I can't find the thing, but uh, th this is in, in uh, a marketing in response to an event that's going on there, right? Isn't it a soccer game or, or something? I don't think it's based around an event. I think it's just oh, to... Oh, yep. It's, it's, they were set it up in random European locations in only 10 days and more could be headed out to the Olympics next year. So this might be a test market for the Olympics, I guess. Possibly. But I think it's more or less just a good marketing ploy by Molson to not only get their name out there in Europe, but to show people that they are proud to be a Canadian company. And, and I was only, I was only interested in this story because I found it to be a very inventive creation of marketing scenario these people at Molson have come up with. I respect good ideas. I respect ideas that are different. I've never seen anything like this. You don't see And it. and we love our neighbors to the north. We do. Canadians rock. Canadians do rock. We love And them. so does Rush. Yes. <laughs> and Rush is Canadian. That 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 can't just be a coincidence, Wally. And it's Poutine. Not. Oh my god. Putin. I think we all love Poutine. Or Putin. <laughs> you say Poutine. I say Putin. <laughs> One of them's right. The other one's not. <laughs> All right. So moving along here. So with that, I think we're just going to take a short break here. And uh, after we get back from the break, what do we got up coming up next? Well, we're going to be taking a look at those humanity stories involving some very young people with some very interesting experiences, as well as some missing persons. In our other segment, we're again going to be looking at some mysteries of the earth that are both perhaps geological phenomenons and an astro-geological phenomenon. All that and more up next on Red Herring Radio. Farm all by myself. The gator farm? That must be a hard work. Oh, 
Oh, it's so hot. You seem to have a heavy amount of perspiration accumulated on your brow. You must be parched. Well, it's 110 degrees out here. No one can't you feel the heat. Oh, my goodness. Why don't you have a seat right next to Miss Maybelline here, yeah, and I'll, I'll yeah, get sit you on a... down next to me, so... And I'll get you a refreshing well, beverage. I came here to kill you, no one. I'm rather parched. I'll sit on down for a minute. Well, all right. Here you go. Try a sip of this. What is this? You got some moonshine for me, no one? Oh, you'll see. Oh, man. Mm -mm, that is crisp. You like that, do you? That's the fresh. What is that, Noah? That's the city water. No way. I can't believe it. This is the most enchanting, refreshing beverage I've ever had. It sure is. You can find out for yourself. I'm Noah Turquoise Jack telling you to buy city water today. Mm, that's refreshing. Warning, the opinions shared on this show are those of free-thinking individuals who without payment or coercion chose to be here and share those opinions with the world. This podcast may contain language, opinions, and ideas that some people may find offensive and or controversial. Listener discretion is advised. from the land of 10,000 lakes. Welcome back to Red Herring Radio. Thank you for joining us again after the break. B. Dizzle, what do you have for us next? Thank you very much, Ninja. <laughs> <laughs> Wally, stop it. Yeah, like, You're cracking me up here. What are you doing? I don't know. Hey, don't judge me. Don't judge me, Wally. Cast no stones, yet they remain unturned. What? What? <laughs> Don't judge me. First up here in our second segment, we are on dailymail.co.uk. Are we evolving into a new type of human? Different species will have evolved by 2050, scientist claims. This is all according to Cadell Last, a researcher at the Global Britain Institute. Mr. Last claims that we will live longer, have kids in old age, and rely on robots. We may also end up spending large amounts of our time in virtual reality. A huge shift, comparable to the change from apes to humans, is possible. I found this very interesting, this this idea, but I don't think we needed necessarily a scientist to tell us this. I think any person with a, a good head on their shoulders could see this is the direction humanity is taking. Obviously, we have uh, more and more robots every year filling in for jobs that people do. Just, uh, I, I almost want to... And I hate to be like negative on this guy, but I almost, I almost don't think that this is even really a necessary distinction that needs to be. And I, I honestly can't imagine it well, taking place in 50 years. Well, as, as as the scientist himself says, we are living longer and longer and longer. 50 years is is not even a single person's life. In in 50 years, you see maybe three generations born. I don't think humanity will change so much in three generations. But Ninja, you have to take into consideration that the advancement of technology progresses exponentially. I, I can understand, okay, we're in virtual reality, we don't do a lot of physical work, like maybe maybe like muscle mass gets smaller, but I don't think like our bone structure is, is gonna change enough to make like a drastic change in our in our species classification necessary like it physically. doesn't seem like in 40 years the people would be replaced on earth in a way enough for this to be such a drastic thing it's kind of what you're getting at yeah well like so... I, I could see almost a new classification maybe maybe existing at that point but it would be like a random mutation that like a handful of individuals might happen to well, pop up just, at once it takes take a, let's just hold on let's just take a look at some of the things this article has to say by 2040, cabs will be driven by Google robots. I don't think that is necessarily something that we uh, would argue with. That's well, already, a, it, that's it, it is a place, strangely it? specific claim to like well, name out the company, are, but I do agree I, that automated okay, cars. Fair enough. Will. I, I think it is probably pretty uh, pretty interesting that they just specifically <laughs> mentioned Google. Google. This article brought to you by Google. <laughs> <laughs> they did. They do own. They a lot. also speak of people having implants bionic implants uh inside their bodies to assist with sight you'll you could have a microchip inside your fingertip that would allow you to unlock your house or i I, your I definitely see that happen now i guess if you want to reclassify humans as a cyborg species i could see that coming up as a new a new species well then. and here's the thing that addresses your point the main kind of emphasis of this article i think is that the lifestyle 
of humans is going to change in this four decades. And that will in have a an way, effect on us. That it's, will it's, have an effect on us. Yeah, I, I, I could believe that. I just think... It's for... a change that's so dramatic. It's akin to when apes evolved into humans. And so that's... Analogy what, that's... is what you're talking now, about. Man. Yeah. Now, okay. now that, that was quite a leap from apes to humans. Now, I'm sure this gentleman who has made these claims... Cadell Last. Cadell Last. Mr. Last. I'm sure he's much more qualified to make these kind of uh, assumptions and claims. You know, if we take a look at this diagram here, the future worker, and let's just talk about a couple of these things. Ten characteristics of a typical worker aged 35 and 2040. Now, this is just uh, assumptions being made by this article here, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. A bigger brain with software and memory updates made possible. Now, that would be the fusion between Whoa. your brain and a computer. Um, yes, that that does offer interesting things because then our, a human education will be achieved by a sh short age. We'd be entered into the workforce like the moment they deem us mature, which they might be able to install as well. Language skills in business, Mandarin, Hindi, Spanish, and Portuguese to keep up with emerging economics and global working. Now, are they saying that more people in the future will be bilingual? Or will there be a melding of those languages? Is I it... think that what they're getting at is these people will understand multiple languages, possibly through the software upgrades in the brain. Now, even. now my brain would tell me that over a long enough period of time, probably not over 50 years or so. But if you have a, a large enough population that is bilingual, those languages would start to meld together. I know, I do agree. Uh, I, I used to live in California, and I saw a lot of uh, Spanish kids who, who, like, grew up speaking both languages kind of phase in and out between English and words. Now, and were words. they Spanish kids or Mexican kids? Oh, Mexican kids. Uh, okay. Mexican people speak Spanish, but there is a distinction between Mexican and Spanish people. Yeah. One being from Spain, the other being from Mexico. Yes. Now, I'm not, like, trying to deny you couldn't have known Spanish people in California. <laughs> we're going to move on now. All right, up next here on the Huffington Post dot co.uk roswell driver wakes up in a field of donkeys after going missing in infamous ufo spot now the reason this caught my eye was because last podcast we were discussing roswell and this case i go either direction this could be a case of alien abduction or it could be a case of the smartest drunk driver ever <laughs> getting into an accident and just happening to be able to use his geographic location to his advantage. I, I don't know. I don't think so, because the driver was issued multiple citations. He's been charged, so he didn't get out of anything. There's still a drunk driver who made a mistake, I think. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Counterpoint. Counterpoint, yes. <laughs> yeah, like, wow. So, like, the green aliens got these guys drunk and... Left him in the field with the donkeys? Well, like, we don't I just, know what aliens do. I just am I not mean, seeing it all. I mean, can, can't we say that's a possibility? How yeah. Do we, how do we know that the Zeta Reticulans don't like grain alcohol? You know, uh, I can definitely see the Zeta Reticulans liking grain alcohol. What about the mole people? Uh, did they like grain alcohol? Did no, you drink with the mole people? I, I did. They actually uh, ferment this really, really terrible tasting alcohol. Out of mushrooms, and no, it doesn't doesn't like make you trip balls or nothing. I know we were just gonna ask. I, I realize that, like the look on your face led me to that immediately, Wally. I, I like where you're going, but Is it no psilocybin alcohol or something like that. I, I you know I didn't have any laboratory equipment to like okay. really take a good yeah. look at it, and not, but you didn't trip balls. No, did not trip balls. Uh, I did get a little tipsy with them, but uh, it, it was just really hard to choke down. Okay, okay. Well, essentially, to sum up this. The story. I just thought it was a silly story. Let's just say what happened. Pretty much... These, these men, these men, there was a reported car accident. Paramedics rushed to the scene, couldn't find the men. The men turned up seven hours later when they dialed 911 and reported they had woken in a field surrounded by donkeys. <laughs> yeah, and they claimed to have no uh, recollection of the missing time. And they admitted to be drinking. They had injuries that were... Somewhat consistent with people who have been in a vehicle accident. Yes. Specifically injuries to the shoulder as well as back. You know, then there's, there's an interesting point. Uh, I have rolled my car, and uh, I did break my shoulder. But do you think these... Do you, do you, <laughs> the rehab's going well. Oh, yeah, do you I'll, think I'll it's possible well. that these men tried to use their geographic location, being in Roswell, and claiming to have missing time? Do you think they were trying to somehow use that to, to their advantage to get out of... A drunk driving charge. Oh, yeah, possibly. And, you know, I think that people just love a good story. So maybe they're working that aspect of it. And People do love a good story. And uh, 
and people love to be in a good story. All right, so I think I think we've had enough of that. Moving on. We are on the telegraph.co.uk. We have a lot of .co.uk's going on tonight. It's interesting over in the UK. <laughs> I guess I guess they're making chocolate teapots. There's no, little girls surviving this, ordeals in a bear infested forest. Yes, this, this Maybe is they a, had a Canadian beer fridge out there and she was That yeah. too. <laughs> She's <laughs> Yeah, but she wouldn't be able to open it because she doesn't have a uh, Canadian passport. Four-year-old survives 11-day ordeal in bear-infested Siberian forest. In Siberia, forest eats you! Yeah, that's totally not how that goes. <laughs> what? In Soviet Russia, <laughs> forest eat you! Oh. So this four-year-old girl, she disappeared for 11 days in the Siberian wilderness. And to me, that is remarkable, a four-year-old, because you can't go three days without water and not die and i'm not saying it would be diff terribly difficult for her to find some source of water in the wild especially in siberia it's not a drought prone so it was in the middle of the summer which it definitely helped her survive out there now in this article here it says she had a dog with her who played a really big role in her survival according to the article it helped to keep her warm and also possibly keep away some of these bears that may have been in the fort yeah i can, I can actually see that it's been uh seen uh interesting animal videos of like cats and dogs actually scaring bears off according to the article here she had lost her shoes and was walking barefoot now the article says she ate berries and drank water from a river to survive now I don't know. Did her parents teach her what berries she could eat? No, well, they were you know, already I, in a sparsely populated region. So you would assume that they would be out there gathering food in the forest anyway, right? Probably. Apparently, her mother was out and about, and uh, they were hunting and reindeer herding. So I think that these are a group of people who are more in touch with nature than, you know, we may be accustomed to here sometimes. Right. No, and even if not, I don't underestimate the ability of children to recognize. She might have recognized those berries as one she'd eaten in the past. Well, even even the just the ability of anyone to survive, yeah, it's just the, it's our the... will to live. I still think it's amazing that this little girl lived. Oh yeah, she's a total badass. Yes, and uh, I she looks like a badass in the picture too. Absolutely, and we are very very happy that she made it home to her family. All right, so coming up here next, we turn to the. EpochTimes.com. Three-year-old remembers past life, identifies murderer, and location of body. Now, before we get into this story, this article interested me because I, one of my main passions, just personal interests, my personal interest, is the idea of consciousness and where it comes from, exactly what it is, and how science really can't explain it. They try to explain it by saying it could be formed by the firing of our neurons in the neural net that is in our brain. It could be a by product of that but that is not a proven fact um to get into the details of it if i may dizzle yeah okay so this three-year-old was born with a birthmark on his face that was a large red birthmark and when he identified the location of where his previous life's body was buried it was accurate and there was wounds to the skull that would be consistent with an axe to the face it also was consistent with his birthmark. When he described where the murder weapon will be found, that was also discovered, and he also remembered the full name of his killer. This alleged killer uh, was white-faced when confronted. This community believes in resurrection, and even they are surprised by the way that these events unfolded. Well, I found it interesting that, uh, according to this article, it's customary for elders to take children at the age of three to the home of his previous life, his or her previous life, if they remember it. Now, this to me would say that there, this is not the only child that's ever had this experience of remembering a past life. If it is customary for the elders to bring them to the home that they remember in their past life. So that, that uh, adds some credibility to this phenomenon. Just when you when you speak about credibility, this is when I'm going to chime in here. Uh, one of the things they, they also say in this article is that it's also a common belief in his culture that birthmarks like the ones he described are are looked at as marks of uh grievous wounds that cause death of a past life now this is just con uh, i guess like a convenient fact but isn't it convenient that 
also within that culture is when apparently this stuff also happens again. You know, you could get into some, like, metaphysical discussion about how maybe it's like the collective unconsciousness of his culture allows that stuff to happen because, like, they're all thinking about it or, or something like that. And that's interesting to think about, yeah, that's a good yeah, like point. Yeah, like, well, um, but I think that, like, through coaching or setting stuff up, like, the, these it's these possible. stories can be very, like, like, who, like, they don't mention in the article, but, like, who benefited from, say, this boy having such a, a public... Uh, an awareness of of his event like uh this is this is going to generate a lot of attention can can like are you someone benefiting from it somehow well, is just what i'm on. wondering let's and, go back to what this article claims are the facts of the case the boy came to the elders said he could take them to where the body where his b former body was buried it was found there. The wounds on the skull of this body correlated to the birthmark on him. He also directed them to where they could find the murder weapon, and that was found. And then he directed them to his murderer, or his alleged murderer. And when confronted by this boy, the alleged murderer, um, as Danger pointed out before, turned white-faced and, you know, obviously knew he was caught red-handed. Because this article says he admitted to it. He admitted to the murder. He said he did not admit to murder. Go down. When he confronted this man, the alleged killer's face turned white, Lash told Geraldo, but he did not admit to murder. Oh. Faced with this evidence, the oh, murderer please. admitted to the crime. Okay, my bad. No, just... I made uh, a mistake. I, I'll, I'll throw one thing out there. Like, the, the kid could have been coached to do all that, and the, the murder, the body, and the weapon set up. That guy could even... I mean, if you're talking some religious cult that is gaining credibility even from this... The, they could they could have a fanatic that'd be even willing to take the fall for the murder. All right, I admit that that it could all be set up. It could all be set up. It'd I guess to convince me, I and like I yeah, this sounds really picky of me, but I like I would want to talk to the kid because like I would want like details of the past life. I'd want to talk to him about what the guy had for breakfast and you know. Well, but he's three for starters. Who knows how well he'd be able to communicate that stuff? And I'm surprised that he, you know to this extent that he was able to talk about that sort of thing. And who knows if this sort of stuff is real? To what extent? those memories carry over this is a huge event your murder so that might stick around in your consciousness but would what you had for breakfast be a thing that would travel or stay around we don't know that's and that's what makes this story so cool is because if you take it for truth or not that's based on you know it's hard to say we don't know for sure if it's true but what's interesting are the implications if it is true. Yeah, that would be that would be interesting now if it was possible after death to to bring back even even select memories to you know, like I guess I'm just like thinking out there but like if human beings could somehow gain control of that and like force it to happen that could be an interesting form of immortality because at that point you could clone yourself and then just force your consciousness into your now blank clone self. Yeah, and that's along the lines of that. Uh... What movie was that with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Oh, uh, the sixth day or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's similar. To it's that. where he like has a baby, right, and is pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> is Johnny Depp in that one? I think so, but um, I don't know movies no, very hold good. Hold on, but in that movie, the sixth day, they were going under the assumption, or in that plot at least, in that movie, consciousness was built or was formulated around the individual thoughts and memories of the person captured you know within that computer it read their brain and it captured it as information and that information coalesced into a thinking mind and an individual now if that's what consciousness is or not we don't really know is is my consciousness created by my brain or is my consciousness something that my brain picks up like a radio so when you have an interesting when you, way to think about it when you start to think about consciousness in that way if you can if you can think outside the box a little bit then things like this don't seem that that far fetched if consciousness is not something created by an individual's brain then i would see no reason why a consciousness could not survive beyond death into a new life in the sense that a new brain born could then somehow tap into that consciousness that's always there but the other side of that coin then is that if it is the case that consciousness is tied to the soul brain or the single brain that generates it then it would seem that that consciousness would end with the end of that brain productivity right 
Right. And I think that way of thinking finds support in our fear of death and not just the sense that death is unknown to us, but it's almost an instinctual thing that we should fear death because that's it. That's the end. Well, that's just the uh, the opposite of uh, the, the human's strongest instinct is that to survive. And what is survival but not dying? And it seems like that instinct or trait is enforced through evolution and time and things like that. And I, I debated this this topic to, to get off into a little tangent here i got i debated this topic with a friend once and we were talking about what happened or what the possibilities of what could be after death whether it be some form of afterlife or if it's nothing and you just blank out of existence and so to speak and this might sound a little messed up to some people but i came to the conclusion that either way it doesn't really matter to me if there is some kind of afterlife great then my experience can carry on and i can continue to learn and grow and expand as a being and that would be wonderful i would love that you know who wouldn't who wants their experience to be over nobody wants that but if it is over when I die, when my physical body dies, if my consciousness just blanks out, it's not as if I will be hovering in a dark, you know, abyss or with no stimulus coming in. There will be nothing. I won't have the experience of feeling bad or feeling happy. It will be nothing. So that, if you if you embrace that that way of thinking, and that's not what I want, but if you if you can embrace that way of thinking that it, it's not bad because it's nothing, then yeah. that, you know, that doesn't really scare me either. And that doesn't really bother me either. I don't want it to be that. But if that is the case, then I won't be conscious of it. So it won't really be that, it, it wouldn't be bad. Does that make sense to you guys? I mean. It, it does. I It's just like a, as a personal life experience it, and I was in a car accident, you know, this, I actually have absolutely no memory of the event. I got a cracked on my head pretty bad and it, it's weird having like a blackness yeah, like a, a nothingness I, in my memory. I uh, I can totally understand where you're coming from. I've also been in a very bad car accident before. Oh, yes, yes. I do remember and this. I was also experienced missing time, if you will. It's uh, it's definitely, if anyone who's experienced, to reflect on just nothingness. Because, like, you're almost, like, aware of the loss of time because you, you feel it in your life because you, like, you wake up and things have changed in your life. Things have happened to you and you, like, there's just a nothingness there. It's a strange concept kind of apathy or uh you can or also, feeling of, you, of nothingness. You can also equate it kind of to uh, when you, if you've ever had surgery and been under anesthesia. Yep. It's the same thing in a sense. The first time I had surgery, it's the most bizarre sensation to be conscious and then not be and then be waking up and you have no idea where that time went. It's just as if it was gone. And that that's, it sounds weird, but that fact comforts me in the sense that if, if after I die, there's nothing, then I won't be conscious of it. You're not conscious of nothing. So there's nothing to fear. There really is nothing to fear. I mean, it's not what we hope for. We, we don't hope that our experience ends after death. To me, that seems so wasteful. I don't think <laughs> the universe would, no, well, really, I don't think the universe would be that wasteful to create something like well, that you're, you're giving, you're, you're, you're giving the universe the credibility of a, of a consciousness or a morality well I only have go on what i have experienced in life and what i have learned and from what i've learned and from my personal experience i would truly say that i do believe the universe is consciousness there is a consciousness to the universe now whether you want to call that god or, you know, I don't call it God because I don't like that term. I think there's a lot of association with that term that's not good. So I try to stray away we'll from it. We'll call that. the universe Bob. I don't even like giving it a name. Even calling it the universe is calling it a name. It should, it's, it's an ambiguous essence, really. It's a thing of, like, infinity and without limits. And the fact that it is without those limits makes it very incomprehensible to us right. as finite human beings. Right. And There's I've, a conflict there I've and a paradox. That. Well, I've debated inherent. that topic with people, too. How us as human beings, we can understand the concept of infinity, but we can't truly grasp infinity. You can't truly know what it is. I had a, I had also well, we can be on a trek towards knowing infinity. Oh, you can, yeah. You, that's, that's what we're here for. That's why we're, that's why I started this podcast, because I want to help not only us as individuals, but I want to help everyone. I want to help the world. Well, it seems like we get there together. That's the only way we're going to get there is together. You're absolutely right. There's no uh, no limit to, I guess, what we can accomplish through teamwork. That sounds really cheesy. Makes but... the dream work, baby. And just before we uh, move on to our next topic here, while we're talking about consciousness, I just want to throw out a theory that I had formulated myself. Now, I'm not saying that I'm necessarily the first person to ever come 
come up with this idea, but I have never read of it anywhere else. And the idea that I had was, what if consciousness as we know it is a singular thing that is not bound by linear time as we know it? And what I mean by that, let's say the consciousness that is me right now, experiencing my life through my eyes, Dizzle. What about if when I die, my consciousness leaves my body, or even if it's not, you know, located in my body, what if the consciousness that is me could travel through what we perceive to be linear time and awakens as Abraham Lincoln and lives the life of Abraham Lincoln? And then when Abraham Lincoln died, the consciousness, the one consciousness that I am theorizing is and is everything, then wakes up as my mother, Dizzle's mother. And then Dizzle's mother dies and the consciousness awakens as someone in 200 BC. And and it just progresses like this. So we are all the singular consciousness experiencing individual lives for whatever reason that it would be doing that. To learn, to grow, who knows. Anyway, that was just a theory I had. I'd like to know what you think about it though. So leave us a comment about this and uh, we will move on here. Up next, we are on unexplainedmysteries.com. The Oak Island Money Pit. Now, Danger, what do you know about this? Yeah, this story is a personal favorite of mine. It takes place up in Oak Island, Nova Scotia. And throughout many centuries, there have been a lot of excavations there and a lot of people who go there and have attempted to kind of get to the bottom of what might be happening. So 18-year-old Daniel McGinnis saw these lights out on the island, and with a couple of friends, they went out digging. As they were digging, every 10 feet, they discovered layers of logs. They continued this for three layers before they ended up abandoning the excavation. It was going back to the Unexplained Mysteries website now, a 19th century expedition followed. This one went a little bit deeper, but ended up having problems with the shaft flooding. Now, some theories on this are that it flooded because the people who designed the pit created as a booby trap. Other people think that this could be a geological occurrence where, because it's an island, there's this water around, and as they're going on, going down, there's, you know, underground caverns that are causing it to flood. So there's some possibility for interpretation there. So basically, just this is just a, uh, a mysterious place where there's specula the speculation that there could be pirate treasure. There could be, I mean, some people have made the claim that there could be um, some religious artifacts there. Or it could have something to do with uh, UFOs or aliens, these lights that we're seeing. Yeah, I'm a little curious about the, the source of lights. But definitely, if, if they had, like, the layers of logs every 10 feet, like, on repeat, that's, a, that's a, like a man-made pattern or, or a pattern done by some some thing with intent well but consider this nature moves through cycles and the changing of the seasons and things like that so if it is a geological process of like the tides coming in and bringing in like this driftwood and things like that and it accumulates in a particular way it may distribute through the seasons in this specific pattern yeah but the, so like 10 feet of even deposits every time over it that's that's oddly consistent if you've ever seen like a geographical cutaway as they're like studying layers in the rocks yeah you can identify the layers but they're wiggling up and down they're not like straight lines according to the unexplained mysteries page here even uh former u.s president franklin roosevelt had some interest in this uh, money pit mystery uh, after he spent some time in nova scotia so this is not this is not something that uh just kooks are interested in this is something people who uh who are known to be quite intelligent have shown interest in and there has to be to me there has to be something to it to get, garner the interest of you know, individuals such as Franklin Roosevelt. I, I want to, I guess I kind of want to know, like, what, what it led people to think that, that it could be, like, a treasure or something. Like, was the area known for being, like, the, the headquarters or the air or the home base of a bandit or pirate or something? Well, just, like, kind of uh, geographically where it's located to be in the northern seas like that in the uh, North Atlantic where there were Viking ships that may have been kind of the pirates. They would may have bases in there, so that's kind of an aspect of how the treasure might be there. Another place where the treasure might come from is that there um, was a war between the British and the French, and there's some theories that there was a French retreat from a base that they had, and when they fled the base, they took valuables with them and buried it here to return later to get them. So that's kind of where the source of uh, these treasure theories come from. Well, just to surmise some of the theories here on Unexplained Mysteries, uh, pirate loot, naval plunder, they have something on here called the Shakespeare Conspiracy. Now, to, to sum this one up, some people believe that William Shakespeare never authored any of his plays, 
and that the real author was Sir Francis Bacon, and that there, for some reason, uh, some people claim or think that there could be evidence of that there. I think this is that's the cool theory at, right there, because if, if such evidence existed, why not simply destroy it? Some people think that the Holy Grail itself is on this island. Again, I don't know why this island would hold the Holy Grail, just because it's a remote location, maybe, or something Possibly, like that, you know? Like, why just, not this location? I, I suppose that's a fair argument, but it just seems to me like it would, from the Holy Grail's original location, which would have been in the Middle East to go to Nova Scotia, I guess it does make sense to move it somewhere far, far away in a remote location, but again, I, I don't know. Uh, moving along, uh, some people consider it to be maybe a natural phenomenon. Which is what I was alluding to with the cycling of the seasons and things like that. Correct. And then some people speculate that the Knights Templar have something to do with this. Now, I would think that... Uh, That's another kook theory. That's just applying the boogeyman that people well, like to so, a connect- mystery. That could be connected to the Grail theory. The Knights Templar had a connection to the Holy Grail, and they got their hands on it somehow. Well, and just a side note to maybe provide some supporting evidence to this theory is that the Knights Templar is a, a subdivision, maybe, for lack of a better term, or I don't know how to put it exactly, but of the Freemasons, who are considered to be great builders. And if anybody was going to be able to build this elaborate hiding place for a great treasure, such as the Holy Grail, it would be the Freemasons who would be capable of doing that, and by extension the Knights Templar, which are a part of the Freemasons. Yeah, that's an interesting connection yeah, to point out. Yeah, this whole story is interesting just because of the mystery behind it, and... Again, I just, uh, I take a deeper look at something like this because of the attention it has garnered from uh, yeah. certain individuals. I, th- I think it would be interesting if one of those, like, really, like, crazy, wealthy, like, super rich guys just decided to just dump a bunch of money into this and just have the whole place excavated. I mean, you could, like, build up a concrete wall to block out water and just, I mean, re- really, let's make it, let's make the name fit the title. Let's dump, like, $10 million plus into this and just. And that's what's done. already happened. When the president was behind it, he had a large budget behind it. And the island's currently privately owned. So who knows where things are at with it. I think it is named that way because a bunch of money has been thrown at it. Multiple people have died in the excavation mm-hmm. of uh, the Oak Island Money Pit. I don't know the source of this legend, but according to our Unexplained Mysteries website, uh, seven must die before the secret is revealed. So <laughs> we're not paying in money. We're paying in lives here if we really want to know the source of this mystery it would seem now that brings up questions in itself but we will move on here our final topic of the night pun intended is going to be the black knight satellite now some of our listeners probably many of our listeners have already heard of this topic because this is something that is very 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 disputed amongst the ufo community i will say that this one was news to me as someone who has you know, read and investigated a fair amount into this sort of thing. I was surprised to hear about this story. I also had not heard about it. All right. Well, the Black Knight satellite discovered in a near-polar orbit, and it was first detected in 1899 by Nikola Tesla, and he picked up a repeating radio signal that he believed was coming from space. In 1954, newspapers, including the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and the San Francisco Examiner, ran stories about a UFO, saying the U.S. Air Force had reported that two satellites orbiting the Earth had been detected. At this time, no man-made satellites had ever been launched that have been admitted to anyway. I'm sure there's plenty of things that have happened technologically much earlier in our history that we don't know about. So, Dizzle, do we got any information about the apogee and perigee of this satellite? Well, apogee would be its... Um, furthest dif- distance from Earth. Okay. During its orbit. Yes, okay. and perigee would be its closest. So yes, its so apogee is... So one... things like the moon, sorry to get Yeah, it have an there. elliptical orbit. So yep. th- Okay, that's what we're talking about. All and right. that has an apogee and a perigee. All right, I, did, I guess I just didn't know those proper terms. Well, to be fair... The... They're be planted fair. by B. Dizzle. He made them up. Yeah, let's... Uh... <laughs> he made them up. That's his biggest conspiracy of all time, is that he's responsible for those terms. <laughs> Well played. Yes. I don't think there are any um, orbits that are completely uh, circular or they have the same apogee and perigee. But I digress. The signal that was reported to be coming from the satellite, uh, reported by some scientists, uh, in 1973, a Scottish writer, Duncan Lunan, analyzed the data from a Norwegian radio.
radio research. And he came to the conclusion that this data was producing a star chart and pointed the way to Epsilon Boötis, I believe is how you pronounce that, Boötis. Sure. Uh, a double star in the constellation of Boötis. Now it looks like boots. It looks like that's boots. how you pronounce that Bo word, but I don't. I don't think it's boots. It's Boötis, I believe. Lunin's hypothesis was that these signals were being transmitted from a 12,600-year-old object located at one of the Earth's Lagrange points. Now Lagrange points. To talk about that really quick so people understand what those are, they're positions that allow objects to orbit where they will not deviate from the orbit. Now, if you have an object outside of these points, the different gravitational pulls of planets, the sun, and everything will cause them to deviate from the orbit and cause them to go off in, you know, any one of many different directions. This is Astrogeology 101. Yes, Lagrange points, though, you can put an object in a Lagrange point, and the gravitational pull in those points cause objects to more or less uh, be balanced and stay where they're at. Now, there are... Uh, a natural stability point. Yeah, essentially, yes. Now... That's not totally true because, for instance, at Lagrange point 2, it's called an unstable uh, Lagrange point, I believe is the term for it. If you have a uh, satellite at Lagrange point 2, it will lose its orbital position over time. You need some kind of stabilization uh, rockets on that particular craft. But there are Lagrange points which are stable, and that would be like, like Lagrange points uh, 4 and 5 are stable Objects there will not, over time, have their orbits degrade or change unless something comes along and hits them or... Another force were to act yes, upon it. Yes, exactly. But just given the gravitational forces, that point is a stable point. So, anyway, back to our topic at hand, the Black Knight Satellite. So the Black Knight Satellite is in one of these Lagrange points. Okay, so in 1998, uh, Shuttle Endeavour had a mission, and they took pictures of this, and it was posted to the NASA website, and they were labeled as space junk, and subsequently later on, certain photographs were relabeled. So uh, many conspiracy theorists claim that is evidence that there is something awry in this whole topic, that why would they post a picture with a certain title, only to change that later. And I want to give a shout out to uh, one of our listeners, Mike B. We're looking at the wikipedia page right here and the closing argument of the black knight article is kind of a jab against this as being a plausible theory and saying that it is more probable that the photographs are of a thermal blanket that have been lost during an eva an eva is extra vehicular activity yes yeah, so it'd be a spacewalk essentially yeah and so pretty much the point there is that mike you said it yourself that Wikipedia is a home to a lot of non-believer claims, and this just kind of supports your argument there. Thanks for pointing that out to us. We will have in the description below a link for a YouTube video about this uh, Black Knight satellite, and uh, this video is produced by the Life Beyond Earth channel. channel. And uh, thank you, Danger Channel. And uh, it has some interesting information in there. I, uh, I urge everyone to watch it and check it out for themselves. Now, at this point, and I, I know there's the, the theory that, you know, the government wouldn't want anyone to know this, but obviously we have the technology, we have our own satellites in space, and we track all of them and their potential interaction with each other. So I don't see why we couldn't easily track this thing. So is the Black Knight satellite leaving orbit during those times we can't see it? Because we can see our own satellites, not all of them, I know. But uh, is it still here when we can't see it? I guess that's the question. I would ask in that is because that does that mean it's it's like it's actually a, a like a satellite is like we have put satellites in there or is it a vehicle? So are you asking does an object exist if it's not being perceived? Posing the age old question if a tree falls in the woods and no, no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? No, no, that that's saying if a sound a sound is not heard, it does. That's like a, a strange parallel to the observation not not existing thing. But uh, no, that's not the question You're I'm asking. Kind of I'm asking. That... I'm asking if there's a potentially a living being on board, or perhaps it's a it's a uh, a device that can transport itself around and. 
perhaps it's only here on Earth for part of its time, and then it, like, goes back to home base and refuels or delivers data and then comes back or something. One part Danger left out at the end of this article is that alternative to the idea that it's a thermal blanket, some people that have analyzed these pictures have suggested it could be the Pakal spacecraft. Now, I've never heard of the, about that. Um, maybe we can touch on that in another podcast. But it's a supposed Mayan spacecraft that was created. Um, yeah, they based the episode we? of Futurama around us. That that could uh, that kind of touches back to uh, some of our previous uh, podcasts. What was the name we, of that one that we talked about? Yeah, when we dis- uh, those were the Vamanas, and that would have been in India, I believe. But that st- again, that touches back to the ancient technologies of the ancient uh, civilizations. And I think this re- this really this topic, the Black Knight satellite. If this is something that is not space junk or a thermal blanket, if this is something that was sent here for some reason. I don't know. I just, I, something draws me to this story. I don't know if it was, we could go back and talk about, um, the first podcast when I relayed the story that of my experience, when I saw the satellite moving across the sky and it made a 90 degree turn instantly and started moving in a totally different direction. I've never seen anything like that happen. I could have no explanation for that. No airplane that I know of could do something like that. It didn't look like an airplane. It looked like a satellite. So, hey, maybe maybe that night I saw the Black Knight satellite, right? Is, yeah. is that possible? I just want to point out that if this thing is traveling in a latitudinal orbit and the Earth is spinning in one direction as it's traveling that way, if you are in one spot on the Earth and it's traveling through that orbit as the Earth spins, that would explain why some nights you're able to see it and other nights you're not. All right, and I think with that, we'll end this this week's show. Um, I want to thank everybody who left us a comment on our last podcast. Mike Blake, thank you for your comment. It was very interesting reading that. And to touch on that just quickly before we end the show, the Atacama skeleton was shown to have 91% DNA, human DNA. Yeah. And a cat has 90%. Yeah. So I... I, I still think it's kind of inconclusive to say that is a human skeleton. I, it still could be, but I guess we don't know for sure. Every species on this planet shares some DNA. That's that's just the way it's going to be. So, the Atacama skeleton, could it be a hybrid? I don't know. We're going to touch on that again, though, in a future podcast for sure. So, thank you, Mike Blake, for your comment. Also, we'd like to thank Dave Dog for leaving us a comment. Shout out. We'd like to thank everybody who has subscribed and shared our show. We're trying really hard to, to make a really good show for you, and it really helps us out. If you share the show and like and subscribe really helps us out so thank you everyone i'd like to thank danger for joining me here tonight i'd like to thank ninja this is your host b dizzle we'll see you next time on red herring radio